Hi everyone and welcome. Today I would like to talk to you about big data. So first we're going to start with what is big data. So usually when we talk about big data it's been commonly done where the way that we can decide if something is considered big data is the three V's of big data. This was actually done by, um, I believe, a particular analytics firm, but this has been the sort of common way of being able to decide if something is considered big data. So the three V's of big data are volume, velocity, and variety. So volume is the very literal, how much data? Much data, much sources. Velocity is how quickly the data is being generated and produced. Variety is the kinds of data. So big data is going to have a lot of different types of data, could be structured, could be unstructured. So an example could be IoT devices would probably be generating big data. There's a lot of data coming in from these IoT devices. It's coming in really quickly. And the data that's coming in is going to be a variety of things from location to text readings to potentially video and sound recording. Sometimes you'll also see big data noted as also including veracity, how trustworthy the data is, variability, so can the data change, and value. Is this actually useful? Why we might be interested in more data. So in general, companies like money. The more money they have, the happier they are. So traditionally, the more customers you have, the more you can make more customers, more products. You can broaden into new ventures, new ideas. And so data ends up being used for that. Data can also be used to better tailor what you have to the people that you're talking to. So let's say, for example, um, I'm using data to start advertising a big sports ball game. I've decided to advertise this big sports ball game to everybody in Massachusetts but perhaps I did not collect my data correctly. And the big sports ball game that I'm actually doing is using highlights from Yankees. Now, if you've ever been in Massachusetts, you know that this will be a problem and you will be booed. So a little bit more data to say like, hey, maybe we shouldn't be, you know, advertising Yankees wins in Boston. Um, another thing is maybe we can advertise sports ball games to people that like sports ball. Instead of just blanketing the entire state, we could look for people that are actually paying attention to what's going on in sports ball. So we can actually save money by advertising to less people and we can likely get more people interested because we're tailoring it more specifically. Real-time analytics can also be a reason that people will be interested in more data. Data coming in continuously means that you can have more analytics and better analytics. So the more and better real-time analytics that you have so you can make decisions on the fly works better if you are using big data. So uh, an example is AI and ML training models. There is actually somebody who is training an ML model and they were trying to figure out if a photo was a croissant or a bear claw. Yes, I am completely serious here. And so they were trying to train the model to figure out if the photo was a particular pastry. And it turns out it was actually able to um, detect breast cancer. So in this case, they were able to take all of that data and use it for something completely different. But having all of that extra data meant that they can now use this croissant or bear claw model to detect breast cancer successfully. Some examples of big data right now. Anything using artificial intelligence and machine learning is using big data. Search engines use big data to give you the best results. Note here, a lot of search engines have been trying to incorporate more artificial intelligence into the search, which you may or may not enjoy, but that is also using even more big data. 
any streaming platforms are going to use big data. It's going to use big data to hold the videos. Um, they're also going to use big data to do things like suggest what you want to watch next and also figure out if what they want to produce is going to maybe make the money. So a lot of search uh, video platforms other than just doing search are actually creating their own content. And we're seeing this more and more through the years are kind of turning into their own cable channels. Um, and they will use viewing analytics to try to figure out what people watch so that they can make more of it. Online advertisements also use a surprising amount of data. While it is true that your phone isn't recording you, it is going to be collecting things like where you are, how often you pick it up, how often it's being used, where you're going, other phones that you are frequently around where they're going, things that you search on the internet, uh, places you might be stopping into. So where do you shop? How often do you shop? Do you do it on a regular basis? Do you go to one grocery store or three grocery stores? Do the phones that you generally spend a lot of time around go to one or three grocery stores? Those kinds of things. So even though the phone isn't recording you, it is recording enough other stuff that it can make some surprisingly good guesses about what advertisements might go best for you. Data lakes. Um, when we're talking about big data, we have to figure out where we're going to actually store the data. So data lakes are one of the places that we can store data. Data lakes is any and all data welcome. So for example, streaming media and suggestions uh, for what to watch, investment houses watching the market, healthcare using past patient data to improve current patient outcomes. Those are all places that use data lakes and will sort of slurp up as much data as possible to be able to save it and work with it so that they can try to figure out what's going on and where the next trend will be. Data lake houses our newer concept. It's a cross between a data lake and a data warehouse. So you can analyze the unstructured data because the lake house automatically structures it. Because data lakes are any and all data welcome, it does not have to be structured data. We can just take all of it and dump it in here. Data lake houses, however, involve more setup. Not everybody wants their structured and unstructured data mixing. So not everybody is going to want the lake house. Commonly, um, a lot of companies will pull all of the data from disparate groups into one place. That's one of the things that will end up happening. And so they can have sort of access to all of the data that they are collecting at all times for everybody in the company. Data warehouses are for relational data only. So this is going to be organized data. This is commonly used for things like business analytics. Data analysts will end up using this. It will also hold a lot of historical data. Because it's historical data, it's a little bit easier to organize, whereas real-time data coming in or coming in from a lot of places, it would be really hard to structure. So data warehouses will take this historical data and use it for things like data mining and data visualization so it can be done for reports. What have we done in the past? What can our past data tell us about what we think might be happening in the future? Whereas a data lake might be all of this data is coming in sort of, you know, all at once. Um, and so we might not be able to organize it as quickly or as efficiently or do much with it. So that's why it stays unstructured for a little bit. Data marts are data warehouses, but for specific use cases and teams. So if you think about it like a data warehouse is sort of a big box store, a data mart is like a boutique. This is very commonly used, but starting to fall out of fashion. This is starting to fall out of fashion because a lot of bigger companies are moving to NoSQL so that they don't have to worry about structured data and table relationships. So because the data warehouse needs relational data, um, it's starting to be a little bit less popular because of the volume of data that's coming in and how fast it's coming in. Okay. AI and ML. So AI is artificial intelligence. ML is machine learning. 
artificial intelligence is really popular right now. Uh, most of you have probably already heard about things like ChatGPT and other large learning models or large language models, LLMs. Um, AI can be anything that is computers doing things that a person can do, but would require intelligence from the person. Some common examples are things like facial recognition, picture recognition, answering questions, or even driving cars. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that's supposed to be machines imitating human behavior. So anytime we can sort of train a computer to do something, that's considered machine learning. So if they can learn without being programmed and use these learned behaviors, and we can train using these computer models, that's considered machine learning. Machine learning does fall into a couple of different categories. We can have supervised machine learning, which is going to be models that are trained with labeled data sets. So this is the most popular right now, and will end up happening is you have people that are labeling the different data sets. Um, so let's say, for example, pictures. We have pictures of cute animals. We have people, humans, going in and labeling this picture as like, you know, cute dog, cute llama, cute goat, whatever. Once we have this large data set of pictures, we can start trying to train the computer so that they can recognize, is this a cute llama? Is this a cute goat? Or is this a muffin? Now, this might seem like a silly thing. How could you not tell the difference between a muffin and a llama? But if you think about it from the computer's point of view, it's all just colored pixels. So what makes it a muffin? What makes it a llama? What is the pattern of the pixels? Where do they have to be to me be able to tell which one's which? Unsupervised is where we're taking a whole bunch of data and basically asking the computer, are there patterns, are there trends? So here is a whole bunch of pictures. What do you notice about these pictures? What's the most common similarity in all of these pictures? Now, maybe it's gonna come up with something like, all of these pictures have large eyes. Maybe it's gonna come up with something like all of these pictures are actually, you know, five by eight postcards. Maybe it's gonna come up with something like all of these pictures are, you know, over 3000 bytes. Like, I don't know. But that's the unsupervised machine learning. Lastly is reinforcement, training through trial and error. Um, this actually has some people to train self-driving cars um, or teach computers how to play games. You basically end up having the computer do something and see what happens. Was it a success? Was it a failure? Mark it. Um, pros and cons of AI and ML. So this is something that is currently being debated in the news. Um, some of the pros of AI is it can be used to make choices faster. It's always available. It's good for repetitive work and it can be good for real-time analysis that a human couldn't do. One of the problems with it, however, is in the pros category, there are things that people are saying, this is a pro of MI, but it's really not. So like, can cost less than other options. I mean, maybe. So it is possible to have artificial intelligence that costs less than other options, but what are you giving up to do it? Um, Another issue with it is a lot of people see AI as less error prone, um, but it's not really. It's just you might not necessarily see the errors right away. Um, and for the cost less and other options, a good example of this. If you have ever had to call in to a customer service or chat with something on the internet, and then you have gotten really frustrated and started yelling, human, operator, human, please. The, the, technically, the AI option might have cost less, but are they going to lose you as a customer? That can cost more. Okay, some cons of AI. Um, I am choosing to see this as a con because there is inherent bias in AI. AI was programmed by humans. Humans have bias. Some people look at it and say there is no bias in AI, but unfortunately, 
those people are wrong. There is actually bias in AI because humans have bias and humans made it. And the sort of fallacy that there isn't bias in AI is actually turning into a big problem now because people are saying, oh, well, you know, AI is going to make perfectly fair decisions. And it's like, it's actually not. It's going to make decisions based off of the decisions that it's made historically and people have made historically. And that's not always a good call. Um, AI is not able to make exceptions. If something wasn't explicitly programmed in, it can't handle it. AI is also not creative. Um, it can't come up with ideas on its own. It can reformat other people's ideas. But unless you're actually training it, it can't learn from experience. And it can't make its own things. Um, there's also a lot of ethical issues with AI implementations. The way that AI is being trained in data persistence. So an example, this is actually AI art. So if you're using one of the AI art generators, it's actually kind of controversial in the art community because artists are not necessarily offering up their art to the AI models for training, but the people training the models are still taking pictures of the art and using it for training. So the AI is creating works that look similar to artists that did not explicitly consent or in some cases have explicitly said, I do not consent. Um, and that is actually a really big issue. It's also an issue with how the AI is actually being used because if AI is being used for things like financial decisions, who can rent, who can get a credit card, and it's based off of historical data. We know historical data has some issues. The further back you go, the worse the issues get. You know, if we trained off of data in the 1950s and I applied for a credit card, I would get an automatic no because it would say, no, we don't give credit cards to women. So, you know, issues. Um, AI and ML can, however, be used in databases. So now that we have some common vocabulary to talk about, AI can be used for analysis and finding patterns and relationships that are not obvious to humans. There can be hidden trends or potential correlations in data that a human might not necessarily see. This can be because it's such a large amount of data. It can be that computers are actually really good at finding trends in numbers, um, where it's just like the plain number that a human couldn't or wouldn't see as easily. Humans tend to prefer things like visualizations, graphs, pretty pictures. AI databases um, actually can store data. So there's a concept of an AI database. That AI database will store data as a mathematical vector instead of traditional data. The mathematical vectors represent the data abstractly, and it can actually have data generated by machine learning. So you can actually see where if there is missing data, an AI database could fill it in. Now, obviously, you can see where this might end up having some problems as well, but um, it is possible to have databases that can fill in missing data, fix what might be considered an outlier, and sort of smooth the data out. AI databases can actually be scaled vertically or horizontally. So more power can be added to the servers that are being used or more servers can be used. AI databases can also support natural language processing. So one of the things that has made AI so popular is people can talk to it like it's another human, you know, hey, AI, can you please do this? And then the AI will be able to, you know, sort of understand what you're saying to some extent. So a database where you can say, you know, hey, database, could you please write me a report on the sales for the last three months? You could see where that would be popular. Um, AI databases can be SQL or NoSQL style. They can also have some predictive capabilities. So you can actually apply some of this to predict future trends. AI and ML is actually in use in databases right now. Um, so an example in the news is something called Dandelion Health is actually using an AI database for GLP-1 drugs, um, where they're actually looking at where to move the research funding and feedback for the sponsors of the trials and using an AI database for that. Some people have started using some of the chatbots and AI to write SQL queries or make the queries more efficient. 
So that's a commonly done thing right now where people will ask AI for their opinion instead of asking, you know, the internet and Googling around, you know, Reddit, Stack Overflow, stuff like that. Um, it said that the U.S. armed forces are actually using AI for data management, decision making, logistics and predicting maintenance. And a lot of major companies are actually incorporating AI into their databases. So uh, Microsoft is actually doing it for structured data and generative AI. Oracle is doing it for things like no code interfaces and natural language processing to ask questions. So um, one of the hot trends right now is basically trying to shove AI wherever it can go. And some large companies have actually made these mandates that's basically like everybody has to be using AI in some way um, which as a side note if you're ever going to be someone's boss that's a really poor way to do it don't just mandate that you have to do something because then you're going to have people being like oh yeah I'll use AI and, and then you know not because it doesn't make sense for them and you didn't talk to them about it mandates are generally not a great way to go so let's say you want to learn a little bit more about AI and machine learning and sort of see how it could be used for data and how it could be used for databases and you want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, this whole, you know, sort of week was very much an introduction to AI and ML because there's vocabulary that you need to have and there's some sort of basic concepts that you need. And to be able to actually work with AI and ML, you have to have some programming and math background for a lot of it to make any sense. There are some examples of ways that you can include AI without necessarily needing those. So for example, Google AI and how you can actually add their Google AI into, you know, let's say apps for your phone or something. Um, so I've included a link for how to go do that. Uh, Kaggle actually has a couple courses on intro to machine learning, but you do have to know a little bit of Python and be at least mildly comfortable with math. And then I've also included a GitHub that has um, a whole bunch of courses at a bunch of different levels for other AI and ML options. Most of them are gonna require at least a little bit of programming knowledge. So um, knowing how to do things like, you know, write a loop, write an FL statement in Python is gonna be helpful for these to, you know, sort of make the most amount of sense. So I hope that was helpful and gives you a little bit of a basis on where to start for AI and ML. And I hope you are all having a lovely week.